Here's a picture of the laser diode that I drew in my engineering notebook. It would have taken several thousand amps. This is about the size of a cigarette as I envisioned it. A rod of gallium arsenide with a P diffusion around the outside and the intact core in the center. And I don't know how it's going to get current to the middle of the diode. I guess I'd have had to drill the hole through the center and put a wire through the middle, but the light was going to come out in a hollow cone. I did have the idea of the cleave ends uh, to form the uh, vectors on the fabric parole cavity, uh, but I don't think it would have ever worked. It would have probably melted before it laced uh, if it ever tried to build one. But uh, as a result of this flawed model and the flawed advice, uh, the laser dialogue was not pursued. Uh, and a uh, valuable lesson I learned is when you come up with a new concept, a new idea, and you take it to the current establishment, they will very frequently be able to tell you all the reasons why it won't work. Uh, and then when you do make it work, uh, they'll jump on the bandwagon and write papers about it and become rich and famous <laughs> on the idea that they tried to shoot down at one time. We did perform an experiment to uh, test things out. We made a tunnel diode on the semi-insulating gallium arsenide substrate by putting a zinc diffusion in the top and we etched the zinc diffused P layer off all but three of the corners and, and we used that zinc diffusion as the only contact of the semi-insulating substrate on two of the corners and we alloyed a tin dot into the third corner to make a tunnel diode. So we had a top contact tunnel diode, anode and cathode, and then two contacts on the semi-insulating material. And we uh, biased the tunnel diode into the alley region to see if anything was happening. And sure enough, nothing was happening. But when we biased the tunnel diode out into the or direction, past the valley where it was just operating like a diode and injecting minority carriers, we saw a change in the conductivity between the two ohmic contacts. Well, we didn't know if this was an optical effect or a carrier injection or what was happening, but we knew we were seeing some kind of an action at a distance here, and we weren't quite sure what that was. This uh, convinced us that something was going on. Perhaps light was being emitted. We didn't know enough physics to realize that for sure the response we saw was because we were getting light emission and that the forward bascale motion eye diode might mean that we could make a diode laser. If there was any light, it couldn't be seen. We were not at all sure it was light. It might have been carrier injection. It was also discovered that the gallium arsenide tunnel diodes degraded when forward biased out into this region that gave the response in the uh, semi-insulating substrate. And this was a very devastating experience because TI had stocked distributors with gallium arsenide tunnel diodes. And when we found out they degraded in one month, we took back from distributor stock more tunnel diodes than the total industry sold that month. And you don't want to have more than one of those in a career. <laughs> That's not nice. <laughs> one experience like that is enough for a lifetime. In the fall of 1961, a Japanese firm brought in an infrared microscope to TI for evaluation uh, by the quality department, they planned to use it to inspect s silicon wafers because you could look through the silicon wafers and see if they had any occlusions or defects or anything of the sort. We heard the microscope was in the plant, so we took some varactor diodes and tunnel diodes, a couple of D-cells and some clip leads up to where this infrared microscope was, and we forward biased the diodes, and they all glowed. They all emitted light. We were elated. We'd seen the light. You couldn't see it with your eye because it, out, it was out in the near infrared around uh, 9,000 angstroms. But all these junctions 
glowed. And we suspect that the solar cells that Gary had been building even years earlier had all been LEDs. Uh, we never did ever check any of the solar cells, but they should have glowed also. Now again, while we knew that Gallium arsenide emitted light, we didn't realize that this meant that the diode laser would work after all. Uh, but we did file a patent application on the LED, and it was a result of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, patent number 3,293,513 was filed uh, in August of 1962 and finally issued in 1966. It took so long for that patent to issue because it was in interference with patents filed by most of the major research labs in the U.S. Now here's some pictures of the pages out of the patent. The spectrum you see there was typical of the gallium arsenide material at the time. The peak at 1.2 microns is due to copper in the material. That was a bad impurity. It's not there anymore. The material vendors have gotten the right cleaned up. You always saw that peak at 1.2 microns in the gallium arsenide at the time. Here's some more pictures. We had the P plus zinc diffusion into a range of the opening in the entire substrate. You can take the light either at the P surface or the in surface. And this is sort of what our first product diode looked like. It had a spaced in contact on the top and the P contact all over the bottom. Even with all the interference, our claim held up. We found that out later that we had a three to six month priority over Bell Labs, Lincoln Lab, RCA Research Lab, GE Labs, IBM Research Labs. So Gary and I were awarded the first patent on the light emitting diode. There was organized research going on at the time in a number of places to try to build light emitting devices, but most of that work was going on with two six semiconductors, which are used in uh, phosphors on cathode ray tubes and things of that sort. The problems with the two six materials is that they usually come in only P type or N type, not both, uh, so that it's very difficult to make P injunctions. Uh, Jerry and I were in the right place at the right time. The technology was ready. We'd been building LEDs for several years and didn't know it. Uh, we happened on the infrared microscope and saw that everything, we were, all the PN junctions got in March night were glowing uh, and were able to capitalize on it. This device, this patent that had some impact on the world GNP, uh, didn't come about as a result of a program to develop an LED. We weren't even thinking about LEDs. It just happened. Uh, I would encourage you as you go out into industry and work to learn all you can about the project you're working on and to stay curious, <laughs> stay inquisitive. And you can accidentally run across more good ideas than the things that the marketing department assigns you to work on. <laughs> so, uh, I've got three patents I'm kind of proud of, the LED, the Schottky clamp logic circuits, and the MOS-ROM. Uh, and those three out of the 51 or so that I have, about a 6% yield are the only three that are probably worth the paper they're written on. Uh, but those three had a major impact. And none of those were developed on a project to come up with that idea. They were all things that happened out of the overflow. They were happened incidentally to the project that we were working on at the time. We were very naive about our development of the LED. We thought we were the only people in the world that knew Gallium Arsenide emitted light. But we weren't talking while the flavor lasted. We were keeping our mouths shut. We had declared it a trade secret. But at the Device Research Conference in the summer of 1962, the first five papers on the program were on LEDs and one of them wasn't ours. And T.I. had a man on the paper selection committee. He didn't